Shalom, shalom. I'm sending you wonderful greetings from beautiful Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Uh, here it's already cold in your area, but here it is still very pleasantly warm, even swimming weather. Now I have to bring you some short messages and I am very, very happy to be able to speak to you via this technical media. Uh, although I would have loved to be with you in person. Now, I want to talk to you about to live as a disciple. You know, in Matthew 28, 19a, it says, therefore go. Well, we have not been going, we have been sitting around. But God says, go and make disciples of all nations. I don't believe we have understood this sentence very well because through the last centuries we have not been going, very few have been going as missionaries, and we have not been making disciples of nations. You know, before the throne of God, there will be not a single denomination. There will be the nations. And have we worked on making disciples of the nations? We have cultivated church members. And this, in this way, we have caused a lot of division and tension. The Lord wanted us to make disciples of believers. Um, but what actually is a disciple? How can a disciple be recognized? Let's look at the Bible. First, disciples are recognized by the fact that they have been, that they have been with Jesus. In Acts 4.13 we read, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I believe nothing in life shapes us as much as the people we meet and the book, books that we read. For this reason, the more fellowship we have with Jesus Christ, the more we give room in our lives and involve him in our everyday situations, the more we look to Jesus, learn from him and read his word, the more we will be changed into his likeness. It is not for nothing that the writer of the Hebrew says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. You can read that in Hebrew 12, 2a. So disciples are recognized. These people have been with Jesus because they have become more like Jesus. You know, we are not to be recognized as church members, Roman Catholics, Pentecostals, I don't know what, Orthodox, but we are to be recognized by our becoming more and more like Jesus because he is our champion and he is our master. Second, disciples are recognized by the fact that they obey the word of God. In John 14, 23 to 24, Jesus gave the following answer to a question Judas asked. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each one of them. Anyone who doesn't love me and will not obey me and remember my words, uh, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. In John 15, 7, it says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Hallelujah. What a promise. Children who give their parents the most joy are probably those who are obedient. How often we bring strenuous uh, creations of our own design to the Lord because we think that he will be especially pleased at our efforts. And then we are disappointed that he isn't pleased with them. The Lord doesn't want our sacrifice. He doesn't want us to try to buy, purchase, earn, or pay off his love through anything. He wants us to obey his word. It's that simple. Everything else that you create from self, 
dear ones, it is worth nothing in the eyes of God. So, sec a third, disciples are recognized by the fact that they bear fruit. In John 15, 16, Jesus says, You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And in John 15, we also read, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. You know, all the famous artists in the Middle Ages had a group of students of disciples. Around them, they wanted to become like their master. They lived with him night and day, hung on every word he said, and learned from him in all situations of life, in order to become perfect copies of their master. And above all, they wanted to do the works he did, whether it was paintings, statutes, or anything else. Some of them progressed so well that it was no longer possible to tell the difference between their work and the work of the Master. And there was, that's exactly what Jesus wants to do. When I read in the Bible that we should do not only what Jesus did, but that we will do greater works, I said, Lord Jesus, I'm very thankful if I ever can do what you have done. But you know, it should be normal for us Christians to heal the sick, to drive out the demons, to teach people and train people how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But for, for you to do that, to be able to do that, you have to become one yourself. So uh, in a similar way, God wants our fruit to be like his. That is that we proclaim the kingdom of God, teach people to obey what he has commanded us, that we set the captives free, heal the sick, feed the hungry, visit those in prison. In other words, do the miracles and services that Jesus did. The Lord once asked me, what are the fruits that Christians should produce? Uh, I answered, love, joy, peace, gentleness. The Lord replied, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which are true uh, uh, which a true disciple also receive in his life and pass on to others. But what kind of fruit does an apple tree produce? A cherry tree, a nut tree. I answered, these trees produce apples, cherries, nuts as fruits. And what kind of fruit should a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, produce? Then I realized that the fruit the Lord expects from his disciples is more, is more disciples more children of God, more Christians. This is what shows our fruitfulness. In the gospel, we never see the word Christians, just the description disciple. It was only in the book of Acts that the followers of Jesus were given the name Christians. Christ means the anointed one. And Christians are the little anointed ones. And that's when they call you Christian, or when you call yourself Christian, you should be very, very much like your master, Jesus Christ. That is the goal that each one of us that calls themselves Christian has in their lives. Now in John 15, 12, it says, Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And in John 12, 26, Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor you and serve me. Dear ones, for me, a powerful example of this love of God expresses itself in following Jesus in an unswerving way as Mother Teresa. She embraced the poorest and most abundant people in India and followed the call of Jesus, even when no religious organization wanted to send her into the mission field. Nobody wanted to. And she lived in this 24-hour relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. She became a woman of God to whom the great and strong and famous of this world made pilgrimages to receive a word from God. I am also constantly grateful for all the priests, monks and nuns, all of them missionaries who obeyed the word of the Lord and moved to Africa 
driven by the love of God to preach the gospel here. To them we owe the millions of passionate Christians who found faith in the living God through their untiring commitment. Their experience, their, by the way, the life's experience of a missionary in those days was three and a half years. And yet they were prepared to follow the Lord Jesus Christ obediently. And every time I sit in an airplane and something goes wrong, you know, I'm not complaining. I remember what the missionaries 100, 150 years ago went through to reach their mission field. I'm thankful that we have now such easy ways. You know, I live here in Africa like, yeah, like in the, it's a fourth taste of heaven. I am so thankful that God called me to Africa. And so, dear ones, God has a calling for each one of us. Listen to him and say, Lord, what is the dream you have for my life? First of all, to be a disciple. That's for everybody. But then, in what area of life does he want you to make a difference? You know, somebody asked me the other day, what would you want to be remembered for when you are gone from this earth? So each one of us has a gifting either writing or cooking or baking or sewing or uh, uh, singing, anything. Exercise those gifts that God has given you, encouraging, teaching, evangelizing. And you will see, you will be so fulfilled when you work with the giftings and the calling God has given you. Because then you are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the love of God will flow through you. So I trust I could encourage you a little bit to not identify yourself anymore as a church member or a member of a certain denomination, but to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for people to identify you more and more as one that has been with Jesus. I also mentioned that God has a dream for your life. I promise you, God has a dream for your life. You know, even natural parents have dreams for their children. How much more our Heavenly Father? And it was about, I was about 12 years old when I realized that my life up to then could not have been everything God had in mind for, my, for me. And so it dawned on me, God must have a dream. And I will not, I don't want to die before God is able to show me that dream that he has for my life. So I want to, to read you a story about the dream of the two trees. There were two trees standing in a field. Each was particularly excited about something different. The first tree loved the evening sky with its myriads of stars, because they sparkled like precious stones. For this reason, it hoped that a treasure chest would be made from its wood when it was cut down. The most valuable treasure in the world should be stored in it. The second tree loved to look at the sun with its warm, bright rays. With its branches and twigs, it reached out towards it. This tree thus had only one dream. It wanted to stand in its place forever. It wanted to become the greatest tree in the world and reach further and further towards the sun with its branches and twigs. People should be amazed when they saw it. They should gaze up into the sky along its trunk. Then they would see the sun and think about God who loves the whole world. However, the wood of the first tree was not able, uh, was not made into a treasure chest, but a manger. It stood in a stable where ox and donkey ate from it. But one night, Mary and Joseph laid the newborn baby Jesus in this manger. They said to the baby, you are our treasure. You are our shining star and we love you with all our heart. In this way, the first tree's dream was fulfilled after all. 
for the most valuable treasure in the whole world lay in the manger. It was God's son, the baby Jesus. And what became of the second tree's dream? The second tree wanted to stand in its place forever and become the greatest tree in the world. People should think about God when they saw it, but it was cut down and heavy beams were sawn out of its wood. They lay piled up in a corner for a long time. Yet one Friday, on Friday morning, they were used after all. Man came and made a cross out of them. It was carried by Jesus, the Son of God. It was then nailed to this, he was then nailed to this cross and died on it. Yet on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. The second tree's dream was also fulfilled in this way. It may not have become the greatest tree in the world, but the greatest sign in the world was formed from its wood, the sign of the cross. It reminds us of Jesus and of what he said and did. Jesus showed us how much God loves us. At the cross, we can look directly up into heaven. God is looking for people who passionately seek the path God has for them and then passionately take this path. Even it at first looks different to what they had imagined. Some of our passions also have to be sanctified by God before he can use them. And the most important thing is and remains and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. That's in Deuteronomy 6.5. Dear ones, I had no idea what the dream was that God had for me, but my passion were always children. And you know, I, I, first I had three siblings that my mother made me accountable for, so I had to do schoolwork for them, I had to take care of them, and then I became a teacher, a high school teacher, and my nickname was Mummy. And, uh, you know, I always wanted 10 children, but God gave me very early the scripture, rejoice your unfruitful one, then you will have more children than the fruitful one. And the Lord taught me a lot of things. You know, English became like my second language. Then uh, I, I was working with a, with a CPA. I was working as a teacher. I was working uh, in a hotel. I was uh, uh, practice. I mean, I was helping very much volunteer work in a hospital. And you know, all of that was necessary for what the dream of God was for my life. And it was only when I was 60 years old that God sent me to the place of, my, of his dream, which was Africa. And now, dear ones, uh, over 16,000 children are calling me mommy. Mama, and I'm known in the whole country as Mama Maria, and, uh, and I am the happiest, happiest missionary, the happiest mother. I am totally fulfilled. I know I am in the flow of the dream that God had for my life, and he's expanding it all the time in all directions. You know, now we are even building a top talent school for the best, uh, poorest street children in art, in music, and in sports. And the school will be, the first part will be finished in, in one year, and then we will start with those children to train them. Because these children, African children, are so full with potential, so full with giftings, but it needs to come out. And especially those children that are street children, because they are survivors. And you know, as survivors, they have to really put, they have to develop a strength that a spoiled children will never develop because they don't need to. They get everything without effort. But the street child knows, I need to survive. And so we are very thankful for this school. But there's, this is just one project. We have many projects and God is stretching me even now in all directions because he's constantly opening new doors for us to minister and to build the kingdom of God on this earth. So, dear ones, please stretch yourself out and say, Lord, 
whatever your dream is for my life, I'm available. And I want you to train me, and I want you to mold me, and I want you to make me. And uh, for this, I would like to give to you the, the prayer of Jabez. You know, Jabez, he was born, uh, uh, it was very sad because Jabez means the one that caused a lot of pain at birth. But Jabez spoke about prayer. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. That's in First Chronicles 4.10. So, you know, I just tell you a few areas where the Lord wants to stretch you, to bless you. So, uh, uh, for example, the area of your faith, the area of your joy, the area of your ability to love, the area of your wisdom, the area of your authority, the area of your power, the area of your service, the area of your prayer life, the area of your cheerful giving, the area of your trust, the area of your friendships, of your faithfulness, of your diligence, of your passion, the area of your hunger and thirst for the Word of God and His righteousness. The Lord will also stretch your area of finances and the area of influence, the area of perseverance, the area of your peace, the area of purity of your heart. And you, there may be any other area that the Lord will show you where He wants to stretch you, where He wants to enlarge your territory. So let the Holy Spirit show you which area of your life needs expansion and then ask God to be with me in everything I do. The more the Lord expands your territory, the more we need His grace, His provision, His love, His authority, His power, His wisdom, and so on. A person whose heart seeks God experiences that needing God is nothing to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, it is. To need God is man's highest perfection. Not I myself and me, Lord bless us three, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. But Jabez didn't just ask for his territory to be expanded, but he also asked that the Lord would keep him from all trouble and pain, which early father and mother has, ple has pleasure in seeing their child poor. Ill. Now, which earthly father and mother has pleasure in seeing their child poor, ill, and in despair and full of trouble and pain? In just the same way, our Heavenly Father, the Father of the absolutely divine love, has no pleasure in seeing His beloved children in a bad way. If trouble and pain should come, however, then trust that the Lord will give you all the grace to come out of the, on the other side of the valley with great joy. In Revelations 1, 3 to 4, God promises us that He will one day wipe away all tears from our eyes and that there will be no more pain. Amina, God wants to really, really enlarge our life far beyond what we think we are capable because for Him nothing is impossible. What is impossible with man is possible with God. I, I experience it, he's still stretching me every day. And that is, that keeps you young. That keeps you flexible. That keeps you joyous. That keeps you trusting. I trust that this message really touches your heart and you will seek God with all your heart and ask him to show you the dream that he has for your life and show you the areas in your, in your life that he would love to enlarge so that he, you can contain everything that God wants to entrust to you. Shalom, shalom. Blessings.